Good morning. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I'm David Rubin from the University of Chicago, and joining me for our breakfast symposium is Bill Sanborn, who is a professor of medicine and chief of the division of GI at the University of California in San Diego. We're really delighted to uh, meet with you this morning and to be part of this inaugural Crohn's and Colitis Congress. We'd also like to thank both CME Outfitters and our um, sponsor this morning, Takeda Pharmaceuticals, for their educational grant and for the hard work putting this together. Bill and I are going to present an update on ulcerative colitis, some of the things we've learned and understand in the evolving area of management in this area. Uh, we also uh, are excited that there's going to be a little bit of a game here. So what you didn't know is that when you chose which, uh, whether the NFC or the AFC were going to win the Super Bowl, you now are on a team. So we're going to be asking questions and doing something in very Vegas style, uh, pitting one team against the other as we go through. So we'll test your knowledge and we'll see how you're doing as we talk about ulcerative colitis. Great, so the first learning objective, recognizing the complex nature of ulcerative colitis that requires risk stratification to drive treatment decisions. The second learning objective, to integrate a steroid sparing management strategy into treatment planning to minimize long-term steroid dependence and associated side effects. The third learning objective, in patients with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis, initiate early top-down treatment aligned with the AGA ulcerative colitis clinical care pathway, which you may not have seen, but you're going to learn this morning, to achieve remission and improvement in an endoscopic appearance of the mucosa. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my uh, co-faculty, Bill Sanborn. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. So we'll spend the next few minutes thinking about the uh, natural history of ulcerative colitis uh, and how that might be modified to improve patient outcomes. All right, so we'll start with a Wheel of Knowledge Game 1. Which of the following is associated with the greatest social stigma? Diabetes, IBD, obesity, HIV and AIDS, or genital herpes? Approximately what percentage of patients with ulcerative colitis experience an unfavorable disease course within the first 10 years after diagnosis? 10%, 25%, 50%, 65%, 50%, or greater than 70%? By order of importance, studies suggest that disease severity in ulcerative colitis is more often defined by which of the following? Mucosal lesions, impact on daily activity, C-reactive protein, and a prior experience of biologics. So that's first answer. Second answer, mucosal lesions, history of fistula, history of abscess, and intestinal resection. Next answer, mucosal lesions, recent hospitalization, recent steroid use, and disease extent. And final possible answer, presence of stoma, disease extent, recent hospitalizations, and prior experience of biologics. Uh, next slide. Which of the following is accurate? Mucosal appearance is an accurate representation of disease status in ulcerative colitis. Both endoscopy and histology may be included in the definition of mucosal healing. Stricturing is more often seen in ulcerative colitis than in Crohn's disease. And endoscopically inactive disease is associated with an <coughs> absence of rectal bleeding and complete normalization of stool frequency. That's a good reason to lose. <laughs> According to the UC CARES study, nearly half of patients with ulcerative colitis are dissatisfied with their current treatment. What percentage of patients resign to living with UC symptoms for the rest of their lives? 25%, 50%, 75%, or greater than 85%? 
So let's uh, move on to a few uh, facts. So we'll uh, start with some general sort of myths and misconceptions about IBD. Uh, in an internet survey of about 1,200 patients, familiarity with IBD uh, self-reported at an average of about 5.54 on this range where one is not at all familiar and 10 is extremely familiar. IBD ranked as having greater social stigma than genital herpes, alcoholism, cancer, diabetes, obesity, and HIV or AIDS. Visible conditions contributing to stigmata, the presence of a stoma, bloody diarrhea, excessive weight gain from steroids, body odor, proximity to a restroom, sudden dizzy spells, skin sores, acne, and gas all sort of contributed to people's thinking. <coughs> Knowledge of IBD was uh, low. 86% of uh, respondents answered a majority of questions pertaining to IBD causes, symptoms, and possible cures incorrectly. And there's the sort of thinking that web-based content and social media sites can significantly contribute to this uh, lack of knowledge. So uh, what does the uh, disease course look like in patients with ulcerative colitis? This is very interesting uh, population-based data from, uh, Copen or from uh, uh, Norway. And basically uh, what you can see is that uh, over time, about 37% or so of patients have a chronic course of intermittent symptoms. Another 6% uh, have chronic continuous symptoms, and 1% have just this progressive increase in symptoms. So you get up to uh, in the low 40s of patients that are having frequent trouble or worsening uh, over time. And then an another way, so one way to, uh, what we just looked at is kind of the temperature of the disease. How often is, in, is it in flare? How often is it hot? Another way of measuring the sort of severity and progression of ulcerative colitis is uh, the anatomic uh, extent of involvement. So this was a cohort study from Switzerland where they looked at the evolution of extent over about nine years. And what you can see is that uh, at the beginning, about 22% of patients had proctitis. And uh, over time, a number of those patients developed more extensive disease, whereas about half of them stayed as proctitis. And then uh, you had about 37% of patients with some kind of left-sided involvement. And over time, uh, as many as 16% of those became uh, more extensive, and many of those patients sort of stayed left-sided. And finally, you had uh, pan colitis, uh, and a small proportion of patients had less extensive uh, disease over the time. But the, uh, the big thing is that a lot of proctitis uh, extends, and eventually you end up with a substantial number of patients who have extensive or pan colonic disease, which has worse outcomes. And then another way of looking at disease sort of severity and progression is um, by the requirement for surgery. And here you can see, again, in Norway, the uh, steady progression over 10 years up to about 9 or 10 percent of patients requiring a colectomy within the first 10 years of diagnosis. So the good news is this is lower than it was, you know, many decades ago, but it's still a fairly substantial surgery rate within the first uh, 10 years of uh, disease. So here is a review uh, looking at the frequency of uh, hospitalization over the first year, five years, and 10 years. And uh, you can see that about 50% of patients end up uh, requiring hospitalization at some point uh, during the first 10 years of disease, and that just progressively picks up uh, over time. And uh, usually hospitalization is a surrogate for severe flares. And then here's uh, a look at the risk of colorectal cancer over time. So, uh, you know, there's some patients who just present with a, a cancer, which is how you get that risk at the beginning. And then you can see there's really uh, no meaningful risk uh, relative to uh, baseline uh, at the early years of diagnosis, and then by the time you get out to seven or eight years, you've got this gradually uh, rising risk above the background uh, risk of uh, one, 
showing what we know, that there's a progressive risk of colorectal cancer uh, over time. And then within that, there's subgroups of patients who have not uh, achieved and maintained remission, patients with extensive disease, long duration disease, patients with PSC who have special risk. And then there's the complication. You're, you're used to thinking about Crohn's disease being a progressive destructive uh, disorder that can lead to loss of intestinal function either through surgery or, or damaging strictures. But what about uh, ulcerative colitis? And actually this concept that ulcerative colitis um, could have long-term complications uh, goes back uh, you know, many years to, um, uh, in terms of uh, its thinking. And here you can see this article from 1966 in the British Medical Journal uh, raising the issue of untreated ulcerative colitis, mostly in those days with strictures and pseudopolyps, carcinoma, and uh, of course in those days uh, you were often assessing ulcerative colitis with barium enema and you would have the sort of famous lead pipe colon where all the halstral folds had been lost. So if we uh, look across all these things, here's um, a study from Italy looking at five years of follow-up according to uh, patients' uh, outcomes from a course of steroids. So whether they had clinical and endoscopic remission, clinical but not endoscopic remission, or neither. And so you can see that in the blue, the patients who had um, clinical and endoscopic remission had quite low rates of colectomy uh, relative to patients who had clinical but not endoscopic remission who, or who had neither one. And then across all the other things, need to escalate therapy, having significant relapses and need for hospitalization, the patients who you achieved both clinical and endoscopic remission uh, did the best over the next five years. And then this is an interesting study uh, that we did. It was, um, the analysis was led by John Fred Columbell uh, from the pivotal studies of infliximab for ulcerative colitis. And we went back and reanalyzed the the outcomes of the patients who received infliximab according to whether they completely normalized the bowel with an endoscopy score of zero. They had significant improvement in, from baseline in their endoscopy score, but had a little bit of abnormality uh, with a score of one, or whether they had moderate to severe residual endoscopic disease. And then here you can see the risk of colectomy. So the patients that got the normal or nearly normal mucosa had quite a low rate of colectomy over the next year as compared to the other patients who had quite a high rate of uh, colectomy. And so this uh, then led to the idea that you would want to do some personalized uh, treat re treatment regimens that not everybody with ulcerative colitis will need early intensive kind of top-down uh, therapy. But you can see there's a group of patients that are at risk for all these complications uh, and progression that you might want to go uh, early to highly effective uh, therapy regimens. And so uh, Corey Siegel led an effort that a number of us were involved with to come up with an overall <laughs> disease severity index that would look at things in uh, multiple domains. So you'd be looking at the inflammatory burden, that's what we're used to thinking about, what does the endoscopy show, what uh, anemia, laboratory studies, uh, but also take into account the disease course. So has the patient uh, received steroids previously? Are they steroid dependent, biologics, disease extent, recent hospitalization, all those things? And then uh, what the effects of the disease are on the patient, just how bad is their stool frequency, their rectal bleeding, getting up at night, urgency, all, all that sort of stuff, and try and link all those domains into a single uh, scoring system. And here you can see uh, what this uh, looks like, and it's now starting to be uh, tested in uh, clinical populations. And it captures these different domains, the effect of loose stools and rectal bleeding and anorectal symptoms and impact on daily uh, living. So uh, breaking into the pieces, here's the, the ranges <coughs> for measuring the inflammatory burden, and you can see how those are scored. 
and then uh, the uh, aspects of disease course and how you would score uh, steroids and biologics, disease extent, and recent hospitalization, and then how these sort of come together. And these would be a couple of prototype uh, patients where you can see that in one patient, the inflammatory burden might be the dominating uh, piece, and the other uh, part might be smaller of disease course and effects of disease. And in another patient, uh, at the current point, the inflammatory burden has decreased, but there's now a lot of accumulated effects of the disease and disease course. So these patients end up with relatively similar disease severity, taking the totality of all the domains to consider, even though their presentations are not the same. And then there's this UC uh, uh, CARE study, and um, there is uh, really a lot of um, morbidity for patients that you can sort of uh, capture in this. So if you take the first uh, question, for instance, I feel like ulcerative colitis controls my life rather than uh, me controlling it. And you can see strongly agree or somewhat agree is 50% uh, of patients. And then you can see uh, in the sort of blue uh, rectangle there, uh, very strong effects for uh, going to the bathroom, a lot that's become part of life, not feeling well from uh, UC that's just become part of life accepted they'll have UC for the rest of my life. That's over 70% of patients, remember that. Um, it's normal to have flare-ups and uh, managing my medications are a struggle. So from a patient's perspective, having ulcerative colitis is a pretty big uh, deal. So in conclusion, ulcerative colitis is a chronic and progressive uh, disease, uh, but we've not had great uh, operational measures over the years for capturing disease progression in addition to the temperature of the disease. And that lack of ability to measure may have contributed to suboptimal, uh, suboptimal management of the condition. And uh, David's going to show you how to apply the modern repertoire of drugs to achieve early lasting remission which is associated with improved long-term outcomes in ulcerative colitis and therefore would warrant early therapy in appropriately selected uh, patients. And finally, uh, patients are looking for medical therapies that would have a rapid onset, high efficacy, long-lasting action, and a favorable safety profile. And you know, the more that we're able to offer that to some degree in the future, the more I think that patients will accept therapies that might achieve uh, the treatment goals that they and we seek, and risk stratification is really the linchpin of being able to appropriately apply that uh, thinking. And with that, I will stop and turn things over to David. All right, <clears throat> so we have um, some great questions that are coming up. Let me remind you that from your iPads, you can enter questions. Bill and I will do our best to answer them once we get completed here. Uh, now, as you heard the um, voice of God from the back of the room announce, we're going to do a little game. Uh, this is a 50-point question in the Wheel of Knowledge. We do the question. Aha, here you go. What percentage of patients with ulcerative colitis will experience a severe attack during the course of their disease? More than 5%, 10 to 20%, 25 to 50%, 50 to 75%, or more than 85%. Aha, see, it is Vegas. What happens now? This is a 10 point question. From 1938 to 1952, what percentage of patients with UC experiencing a severe first attack died? 10%, 25%, 35%, 50%, or more than 60%. Remember, this would be in the uh, early days, 1938 to 1952. Next question, how many points is it worth? There we go. 100 points. This is an important question now. 100 points, you can change the score of the game. The use of corticosteroids for moderate to severe UC is complicated by considerable side effects, including which of the following? Lymphoma, psychosis, rectal bleeding, QT prolongation, or persistent AV problems? That was a joke. <laughs> All right. Let's see how you did. 
I'm sure that we're going to have some good answers here, Derek. Great. Next one. Another 100 points. What percentage of patients with UC who receive steroids experience side effects? More than 25%? I think that's supposed to be less. Let's say less than 25%, 30%, 40%, 50%, or more than 60%. One more question. Ten points. Steroids have been a mainstay of UC therapy, but long-term use is associated with which of the following? Steroid dependency for disease control, steroid-associated rheumatic disease, hypoglycemia, high-dose maintenance therapy, or irreversible side effects. Okay, 50 points. Corticosteroid efficacy for ulcerative colitis is often limited after one year of treatment because nearly all patients become steroid dependent, only half of patients will have a prolonged response, over half of patients will require surgery, or 65% of patients on oral therapy will become steroid refractory. So let's learn a little bit more about steroids, as much as we love them and hate them, and what Bill can tell us. All right. So recall what we were just looking at, which is the sort of what's <coughs> happened, uh, the good side of uh, steroids, as uh, David just said. So look back to uh, the 1930s up to, to 1950s. If you got hospitalized with a severe attack of ulcerative colitis, you had about a 35% chance of dying. And then as uh, steroids were introduced uh, in the later 1950s, by the next decade, you could see that it dropped down to less than 10%. And with advances in uh, care by the 70s, it's down to, to very low numbers, which uh, persist uh, today. So steroids still, of course, play a, a role in ulcerative uh, colitis in the uh, severe patients. And here's some more recent uh, data uh, from Italy, and you can see that in the most uh, recent five-year uh, that they looked out there, mortality was zero. I think you will still see the occasional uh, death, but, it, but the number would be close to zero uh, these days, I think. So uh, this is uh, some work that I did with Bill Fabian at Ed Loftus years ago when I was at the Mayo Clinic. And uh, we had a population-based <laughs> cohort of patients that we followed for many decades uh, in Minnesota. And uh, we looked in this study to see what happened after patients received their first course of steroids. And you can see that 86% of patients initially uh, responded, with more than half of patients having a complete response. But then when you followed these patients with ulcerative colitis out over the next year, 22% were steroid dependent and 49 or 29% uh, had surgery. So only about half of patients had a prolonged uh, response. So you should realize that when you uh, prescribe steroids to a patient with ulcerative colitis, right out of the gates over the course of the next year, there's going to be a 50% chance of uh, failure. And um, so you've got to monitor the patients carefully to make sure that A, they responded in one hand, but B, that they've successfully weaned off the steroids without relapsing. And if they relapse, you reclassify them as steroid dependent and introduce the therapies that we'll, David will talk about uh, shortly. And then there's the toxicity issues. We had several Wheel of Fortune questions about that. You know this long list uh, from your training and clinical practice uh, experience. Psychosis can be up to 15% of uh, patients or so. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, cosmetic things, but probably the big thing is infection. And uh, Jim Lewis uh, and colleagues did a, a population-based study based on about 10% of the British population and found that your chances of dying uh, from steroid therapy, if you get more than 20 milligrams for more than uh, two months, is about threefold elevated uh, compared to placebo. Here are those. Uh, uh, data. So concurrent use of steroids almost threefold elevated, recent steroids two and a half times increased risk, not of side effects, but of mortality. Um, all right, so we come to uh, game three.
We have a few more questions. Let's do it. Let's see if we can have the uh, NFC edge out the AFC. Ten point question. Which of the following, there you go, is a primary goal of ulcerative colitis therapy? Monotherapy, no steroids, reduction of flares to only three times in a year, or no need for surgical intervention within the first five years? Which is a primary goal of UC treatment? Bless you. Come on, 100 points. Uh, this is a 50-point question. In patients whose ulcerative colitis is not adequately controlled, step-up algorithms suggest that a high-intensity regimen would include which of the following? Cyclosporin, topical 5-ASA agents, systemic 5-ASAs, or 5-ASAs with the addition of immunomodulators. Next question. Oh. Where have you been? 10 points. Most patients with ulcerative colitis experience at least one indicator of suboptimal biologic therapy within the first three years of therapy, with the most frequent being so measures of suboptimal therapy, augmentation, dose escalation, discontinuation, switching to other therapies, or disease-related urgent care. Which one do you think it is? Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about measures of suboptimal therapy and what we can learn from them. Next question. There we go, 100 points. This is your chance, NFC. According to the ulcerative colitis care pathway, which of the following is a low risk factor for colectomy? Diagnosis at age under 40, deep ulcers, history of hospitalization, mild endoscopic disease, or disease that requires the use of steroids? Next question. 100 points. In patients with ulcerative colitis who have a loss of response to an anti-TNF agent, despite therapeutic drug concentrations, um, I assume that means despite ther uh, measured therapeutic drug concentrations, which of the following is an appropriate next step? Augment by adding thiopurine, switch to vetalizumab, switch to another anti-TNF agent, in other words, stay within class, or increase the dose of the anti-TNF agent and decrease the interval. Great, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Last question. 10 points. Which of the following are appropriate treatment options for high-risk inpatients with ulcerative colitis? IV steroids, IV cyclosporin, or infliximab, cyclosporin, methotrexate, or adalimumab, methylprednisolone, cyclosporum, or vetalizumab, or azathioprine, cyclosporin, or golimumab. So which is the best answer here as appropriate treatment options for a high-risk inpatient with UC? So let's talk a little bit about managing UC. The first is that I think Bill has set this up nicely uh, to understand some of the progress we've made, but also some of the risks and challenges we face in people with ulcerative colitis and that the disease can progress. Of course, we should always remember that we haven't yet figured out the actual cause of ulcerative colitis, or I should say causes of UC. We have a lot of theories, and of course, as we watch UC become a global disease, many have uh, blamed the environment and directly or indirectly dietary changes. In addition, there's a large primary non-response rate to therapies that are available. And even when therapies work initially, unfortunately, there is a very large and fairly predictable loss of response rate with our current treatments. There are a number of adverse events that are real and some that are exaggerated or misquoted, uh, and that has led to great fear by patients and, frankly, by our colleagues uh, in terms of comfort levels with prescribing the therapies and using them earlier. There's also, of course, the fear of disease-related complications like cancer, although as you saw from Bill's presentation, 
the cancer risk in colitis has neared the risk in the general population. And as one of you in the audience already asked in your question to the iPad, um, maybe this is the result of effective surveillance. It certainly may also be the result of effective treatment and available surgical approaches. We, of course, have come to realize that although surgery is needed in, in many patients, um, it is not a cure like we were told uh, years ago. It has its downsides and we've learned a lot about the development of pouch complications and pouch inflammation. And lastly, more and more, and, and at this meeting there'll be some new data presented, there's mismatched expectations and confusion between patients and providers regarding treatment goals and how we should achieve them. The updated goals of treatment for IBD uh, continue to include both induction and maintenance strategies. The concept of induction of remission for ulcerative colitis has been modified in recent years to include the concept of deep remission. In other words, after achieving control of the disease state, the optimal approach to management also achieves healing of the bowel or some other objective measure of control of the inflammation. Importantly, the maintenance phase of managing ulcerative colitis uh, includes the absence of steroid use, as you've heard, the risks and complications associated with steroids, but also that they really just don't work long term, as well as recognizing that if we are able to prevent relapses over time and continue to maintain stable remission, we can actually change the natural course of the disease and prevent some of the progressive complications that Bill taught you about this morning. And lastly, uh, we've learned more about how to monitor the disease for subclinical relapse before the patient suffers complications, and we're learning more about how we might adjust therapies in more proactive ways and continue to prevent such things as vaccine-preventable illnesses and cancer. Our current medications for ulcerative colitis have expanded in recent years and, of course, include the classes of therapies you see here, the 5-ASA therapies, the steroids in a variety of formulations, immunomodulatory therapies, which includes the calcineurin inhibitors, cyclosporin and tacrolimus, and the biological therapies, which now in ulcerative colitis include two classes, the anti-TNF therapies and the anti-integrin or leukocyte trafficking inhibitor therapy, betalizumab. Historically, we've looked at pyramids and we've talked about stepping up, and it was based on understanding both the uh, disease severity at presentation, as well as um, how sick the patient is when you're trying to make new treatment decisions. And there were a variety of strategies that tried to imply that if you worked your way up the staircase or up the pyramid, the patient would end up on a treatment that worked and then you would be committed to staying on that therapy. There have been a variety of challenges to this type of approach that I'm sure many in the room are quite familiar with. The first one is it has uh, little to do with prognosis of the patient because you're always looking at how sick they are right now with less of an eye on what might happen later. The other challenge is it doesn't really reflect adjustments based on heterogeneity of patient types, whether it's disease extent, endoscopic appearance, or some of the other risk factors that we'll cover. And because this has predominantly been a reactive strategy, and frankly our payers continue to rely on us using a reactive strategy, we have to fail or have a complication from one or more treatments before we get to the next one. We're always trying to catch up, and it's fundamentally opposed to our general principle of medicine, which is to try to keep people well and to be ahead of the disease process. The last challenge has been that new therapies, as they're being developed and even in their clinical trial designs, are usually positioned last or late. And therefore, when a new treatment comes available, regardless of its relative efficacy or safety, payers put it at the end of the line, and we think of it at the end of the line. So the new treatments are held to the highest bar with the sickest patients. So we have a lot of challenges here if we want to change the way you think about managing your colitis patients. It is not uh, an exaggeration to say that the development of anti-TNF therapy, and specifically the first one, infliximab, in the treatment of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis was a revolution in IBD. This is showing you the pivotal trials called ACT-1 and ACT-2 of ulcerative colitis patients. These were moderate to severe UC patients who were not hospitalized, uh, and looking at doses of 5 milligram and 10 milligram per kilogram compared to placebo. You all know well now 
the response and remission rates were st statistically significantly better than placebo, and of course this led to the regulatory approval of the drug. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have as much dose flexibility in the label, although for the most part, we've been able to adjust dosing as we needed um, based on our ability and payers' flexibility in that regard. Subsequently, we of course uh, developed and have available two injectable anti-TNF therapies. They're shown side by side here in their induction data, adalimumab on the left and golimumab on the right. And uh, the consistent messaging that has come out of studying these therapies is that patients do better when they have a loading dose with the therapies and when they're committed to ongoing maintenance. And you can see the evolution of treatment endpoints in the clinical trial designs as we've gotten better at this to include important endpoints as secondary endpoints like mucosal healing or endoscopic improvement. So we've learned more about how to use these therapies, but I want to point out to you one of the points I said earlier. If you look at the remission rates here, on the left it's the first set of bars uh, in the adalimumab chart, and on the right it's the red um, bars in the golimumab results. Remission rates, although better than placebo, are still quite low, and there's lots of room for us to do a better job with these therapies. When you look at the maintenance strategies for these drugs, although they work better than keeping patients on placebo out to a year, you can see here relatively low rates of stable remission over time. There's clearly a pressing need not only to identify better induction strategies, but also to keep patients on therapy longer with either better ways of adjusting these treatments or finding ways to modify over time. One way to think about this is to have a better understanding for what's happening to the drug. So we've learned a bit about therapeutic drug monitoring, and I'm betting that most of the experienced people in this room and at this meeting have used therapeutic drug monitoring in reactive ways. A patient's losing response and you want to know what happened to the drug, where is it, and how can we modify treatment. On the other hand, one way to understand this is to be more proactive, and although we don't recommend this for all patients, there certainly may be patients who are higher risk and patients that you're concerned about in which a post-loading drug level is useful to predict the likelihood of outcomes later. So what you're looking at here was a post hoc analysis of ACT1 and ACT2 in which the infliximab level was measured and that's broken down into quartiles here. And what I want to emphasize for you is that the third and fourth quartiles in other words, the highest infliximab levels at week eight were predictive of the outcomes at weeks 30 and 54. Another way to say that is in your higher risk ulcerative colitis patients, if you obtain a week eight drug level, you can predict the likelihood they're gonna be doing okay at week 30 and 54, and the implication is you could adjust the drug dosing uh, or exposure in the patient to try and keep them under control. Why wait until they have a problem and come back and are relapsing to find out that you just were underdosing from the beginning? So I think that this movement towards understanding um, appropriate use of therapeutic drug monitoring proactively in some of our higher risk patients is quite important. And I'll tell you who those high risk patients are in just a moment. When we look at vetalizumab, recall that this is an anti-integrin therapy that targets alpha-4, beta-7 integrin. Uh, integrins. Um, this had uh, quite striking and significant results in the pivotal trial for ulcerative colitis called Gemini 1. You're looking here at the clinical response and remission rates with vetalizumab, as well as the secondary endpoint of mucosal healing. I just want to point out to you again that although this was definitely better than placebo and we're very pleased with the therapy overall and its efficacy, uh, there's still lots of room for improvement in trying to capture these moderate to severe patients. In the maintenance phase of vetalizumab, it hit all of its endpoints, which included important ones for us as clinicians, durable clinical response, mucosal healing, durable remission, and steroid-free remission. Remember that one of our maintenance goals is to prevent the need and use of chronic steroids. One of the important sub-studies or post hoc analyses from the vetalizumab trial was this one which is that patients who had not been previously exposed to TNF, the TNF-naive ulcerative colitis population, actually had better remission and response rates 
than those who were prior TNF failures before they got into the clinical trial. This may either represent a natural selection bias in the sicker patients who've already failed TNF going into a veto trial like this, but there may also be something specific about the disease mechanism that we should learn. So the question that comes up when you see data like this, and I'll tell you that in Crohn's disease, the same data and results exist for ustekinumab, is which patients would you treat with vetalizumab before you get to an anti-TNF therapy? In other words, how can you best take advantage of these observations and use the therapy earlier and have better results? One of the things that we've kept an eye on is the safety of vetalizumab. Recall that because of its mechanism, it's gut selective and also distinct from natalizumab, which is less selective in its integrin blockade and has an effect on the central nervous system. Vetalizumab does not. And in this longer term follow up study by Jean Fred uh, that was published in Gut last year, you can see that overall the drug has remained safe, in fact, in some cases better than placebo in the follow-up, and very importantly, there have been no observed cases of PML um, through the clinical trial follow-up or through the FDA's adverse event drug reporting system. This is important because um, patients continue to read about PML and getting scared and nervous about it, and we have to make sure we're communicating what we know. And the mechanism and the data support that that doesn't seem likely at all with this therapy. Now, just a word on cyclosporin. I'm showing you two different um, papers that were published, what were similar uh, from a similar study, which compared patients who had IV steroid refractory hospitalized ulcerative colitis, who were randomized to receive either cyclosporin or infliximab. And the results of this European trial suggested that the likelihood of a colectomy-free survival was the same whether they received cyclosporin or infliximab, and importantly, the safety outcomes were similar as well. So it's an important thing to understand that if you're not comfortable using cyclosporin, um, at least these data would suggest that infliximab in the hospitalized IV steroid refractory patient may be a reasonable alternative, and we could perhaps talk about some of the subtleties to these results. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I think cyclosporin may have a, a, a role in some of our patients, and we can think about that together. Now, we talked about this concept of suboptimal therapy in our questions, and the reason we brought that up as one of the pretest questions is because we've done some analyses to try and define what patients could potentially have been benefited by a different treatment strategy. This wasn't implicating that the doctors or the healthcare providers did a bad job managing them. It was really just looking at what happens to patients who are on biological therapies. And this, the indicators of suboptimal biological therapy were sort of obvious. The things that as clinicians would require you to intervene, dose escalation, discontinuation of the therapy, switching to a different treatment, augmentation, which means adding another therapy to the one they're on, ending up in surgery, or requiring some kind of urgent care visit. And you can see here that actually discontinuation by 12 and 36 months was quite significant. In other words, after we get patients on therapy in the real world looking at this um, market scan commercial database, there's quite a lot of therapy changes and challenges we all face. And we all know the, the hardship of trying to uh, figure out what to do with these patients and, of course, to fight with payers to get the next treatment approved. So let's think a little bit about how we might position our patients differently and actually stratify our UC patients rather than doing the standard step up, but instead work on uh, ways to uh, treat them a bit more aggressively, especially for the high-risk patients. There's a nice paper, which is a care pathway paper published in Gastro by the AGA with the first author, Thamos Disopoulos, and a group of authors who worked with him. And the recommendation is not just to think about how sick is the patient sitting in front of you, but also what is their prognosis? What is the uh, risk for colectomy? Those patients with low risk were those who had limited extent of disease, left-sided or less, and mild endoscopic disease when you scope them. And on the right, all the risk factors for high risk, um, extensive colitis, deep ulcers on scope, diagnosis at age less than 40, a high CRP or ESR, requiring steroids early in your course, and you saw the outcomes from the Olmsted County database that Bill presented 
having been hospitalized for the UC, and very importantly and relevant to the epidemic we're seeing, having a C. diff infection or a CMV infection. And just a minor point to remind you, at DDW this year, there was a presentation that showed that when patients have C. diff, they also have a higher risk for CMV. So just because you find one doesn't mean you shouldn't also look for the other. So these are the patients in your practice in whom you should be thinking immediately, going up the staircase with 5 ASAs and immunomodulators is unlikely to be the right course of action because this is a patient who has a high risk for colectomy. So the general approach in this care pathway is, of course, to make the diagnosis and assess the inflammatory status, both with labs and endoscopy, and then to assess comorbidities and disease and therapy-related complications, which um, we've covered a bit already. Then after you've stratified according to colectomy risk, you make your choice of therapy. In a low-risk patient, it's reasonable to start with our foundational therapies of 5 ASAs and potentially some of the bowel-selective uh, corticosteroids like budesonide. In the higher risk patients, especially somebody who ends up in the hospital, you should be moving quite rapidly to the effective treatments for those high risk, moderate to severe or severe patients. And we'll cover what some of those are. If you are wondering what the comorbidities and disease and therapy related complications are, remember that uh, there is a well described risk of thromboembolic complications in IBD and specifically in colitis related to the degree of inflammation. There is a higher risk for neoplasia associated with chronic changes and the degree of inflammation over time. And although rare, the toxic megacolon or fulminant colitis, of course, needs uh, urgent surgical evaluation. So there's a variety of things to keep in mind and to help you make decisions. The patient doesn't have to get sicker on each treatment before you make a move to a different strategy. So the general course for a patient who is high risk but still outpatient, hasn't been admitted yet, is to think about a short course of steroids. And uh, if they respond quickly to the steroids, a thiopurine maintenance strategy may be reasonable with TPMT assessment prior to dosing. In the maintenance strategy, if these patients did well, you want to, of course, re um, taper the steroids and keep them on the thiopurine. But if this doesn't work, the recommendation in the care pathway is you can either use an anti-TNF with or without a thiopurine or vetalizumab with or without a thiopurine. And in this data analysis and care pathway, methotrexate is your combination strategy. I would just say as a caveat based on my own practice, I use methotrexate with the anti-TNFs as well. The other option if you have to induce with an anti-TNF with or without the thiopurine is you continue it in maintenance. If you induce with vetalizumab with or without an immunomodulator, you continue the same strategy in maintenance. And if you are unable to achieve remission with these medical options and the patient is still outpatient, you should be um, admitting them to the hospital for more intensive strategies. Now in the high risk outpatients who don't achieve remission, you can break them into those who don't respond to prednisone and those who are unable to be maintained off steroids. In my practice, I tell patients that steroid-free remission is defined as they are off their steroids and they don't have any relapse within three months. So I tell them we don't celebrate success of our strategy until we reach 90 days steroid-free. And the reason I use that in my clinical practice is because that predicts the likelihood they'll be steroid-free at a year. And then, of course, you think about whether your patient who you may have started with a biological therapy has lost response to it and the reasons for that, which have been covered in other lectures. But the bottom line is make sure you know, is the patient inflamed and not infected? And where is the drug? Is it still present or is it being cleared too rapidly, either because of the pharmacokinetics or potentially because of the development of anti-drug antibodies? So a variety of things to think about and to understand before you end up bringing the patients in the hospital. Once you admit them to the hospital, of course, we have a more aggressive strategy. Um, there are a number of studies now that tell us that after you've excluded infection, if the patient doesn't respond to three days of IV steroids, it's time to move on to a different treatment. So keeping them on IV steroids for 7, 14, I've seen patients on them for weeks. Um, is not going to buy you anything. The data do not support that. So after three days of IV steroids, if they haven't had a dramatic improvement, it really is time to um, implement a different strategy. And whether that's infliximab or an option in the AGA care pathway, cyclosporin, if you have experience or access to a referral center that can do that for you, 
you need to be moving through that. In our hospital, when people are admitted for uh, UC, of course we rule out CMV and C. diff right away. We also get a surgical consult right off the bat. We want to make sure patients understand that we're um, going to be moving through our options, and we also use that as an opportunity for them to be educated about what might be required if they don't respond to these treatment strategies. Now, the thing about IV cyclosporin that many in the room may recall is that it's really meant to be an induction therapy. It's not what you continue into maintenance. So you do need to have a bridge strategy. Traditionally, this was for people who were thiopurine naive, where you would bridge to a thiopurine, and there are some nice older studies to demonstrate the efficacy of that. More recently, there have been some um, data collected by us and others that you can bridge to vetolizumab, given the selective and safe nature of that therapy. So another option to keep in mind if you're comfortable or learn how to use cyclosporin is whether you would use cyclo as a bridge to veto in somebody. Now, when might you use cyclosporin? Well, one option is to understand that in somebody who may be leaking protein, who has a low albumin, and in whom you can't get a protein-based therapy like a monoclonal antibody sufficiently dosed or exposed, it may be an option. But obviously, those are significant and risky patients, and we can think more about that as a group. So what about top-down strategy? You know, we've tried to move away from that term in our field, instead thinking about the right treatment for the right patient based on severity and prognosis. But the general principles are you can gain control earlier in the disease, you may achieve a greater amount of remission, you may um, reduce the likelihood of loss of response over time, and of course this all gets back to our patients who need an improved quality of life. Unfortunately, in ulcerative colitis, there are not yet prospective data to support this general strategy. There are lots of data, though, to support the use of therapies and to understand who responds better. On the other hand, we, of course, have much more data on this strategy in Crohn's. So one way to think about using this in a judicious way is to employ a treat-to-target strategy in your management of your colitis population. Now, to remind you or to teach some of you for the first time, Treat to target refers to a systematic assessment of an identified target for your individual patient with adjustments of therapy through essentially an algorithm of optimization and a changing of therapies until you either hit the target, run out of options, or you or the patient are unwilling to proceed further. If you achieve the target, it also implies that you would then continue to monitor whether you stay on target over time. The primary goal is to maximize health-related quality of life, and the, uh, the way this works is to try to move through therapies more rapidly and more precisely than to wait for people to be failing and to sort of linger, uh, languish and, and suffer. Um, treat to target has been demonstrated to be effective in a recent prospective randomized trial in Crohn's disease that I would refer you to. There are not data yet to support this in a prospective way in UC, but there are some very nice retrospective data from Bill's group, actually, in San Diego, demonstrating that with the adjustments of therapy, you can actually achieve mucosal healing and even histologic improvements by making some adjustments and monitoring your patients over time. So one way to understand how you can do this if you're feeling a little unsure about which treatments to use is understand what your target is, steroid-free remission, mucosal healing or improvement, and move through your therapies rapidly to get to where you need to go so that your patients are going to achieve their uh, preferred goals sooner. So the SMART goals uh, and the summary of this presentation today is to understand um, and to start incorporating prognosis in your choice of therapy, to know who's at higher risk, and to not be shy about using the available, effective, and proven therapies to get your patients well so that you can do so quicker, with the implication that you're going to have better results short-term and long-term. So with that, I'm going to um, try to work with Bill here to answer some of the questions from the room. Okay, Bill, one of the questions here is when would you use combination therapy with vetolizumab? Um, I think if patients have already been through uh, anti-TNF therapy and you're using vetolizumab kind of as a last-line agent, and often you've had some immunogenicity with the preceding biologics, that you probably want to do it, and you could use either thiopurines or methotrexate. Um, the sicker the patient, the more that I think they have a high drug clearance, so if you see a, a, a patient where you might use uh, vetolizumab as 
primary biologic therapy, but they've got a low albumin, and you're really worried about high drug clearance, that's another place where a th a thiopurines would help, I think. On the other hand, if you have a sort of moderate patient, uh, this is gonna be their first biologic, they're a bit risk averse, and they really want the safety profile of betalizumab, which you start to tarnish as soon as you add a, a combination agent, then that patient I probably would give monotherapy to. Uh, you're part of uh, the Victory Consortium of centers looking at betalizumab in the real world. Did you guys look at combination therapy? Was there a benefit in efficacy with that? It, it's not very clear, maybe a subtle one, but you know that's generally true in, um, when you look backwards, it was true with anti-TNF drugs as well. You kind of had to do prospective studies to show the difference. Because if, for all the reasons that I just said, the, the first patient that I described and the last patient that I described are not the same. Yes. And, and so there's a lot of sort of selection bias that makes those data hard to interpret. Yeah, so I, I agree completely. In my practice, the people I leave on combination therapy with betalizumab are those who've had immunogenicity issues uh, or clearance issues with their anti-TNF agents when they were previously exposed. Um, in our experience at U of C, we did not see an efficacy benefit when they were in combo, but it was clearly a biased cohort when we finally did our analysis in that regard. Bill, do you ever experience joint pain in your patients with betalizumab, and how do you manage it? You know, in the clinical trials, we didn't see that so much. We do see it sometimes in clinical practice where it's kind of new onset. Um, I think people are still sorting out that out. Uh, we went back to the pivotal studies and looked at the frequency of extraintestinal manifestations and it actually looked like that arthritis was a bit less in patients who got betalizumab compared to placebo. On the other hand, we did some work with a claims database where you had much larger numbers of patients and larger sample size for extraintestinal manifestations, and the extraintestinal manifestations were more commonly active on betalizumab than on anti-TNF drugs. So I, I think there will be patients where the extraintestinal manifestations, including arthritis, are not as well controlled on betalizumab, but many patients do fine. Yeah, uh, in my practice, um, uh, the first question is, is this steroid withdrawal, uh, if I'm tapering off steroids, because that certainly is a common side effect. Uh, and if we um, have difficulty managing it beyond adding sulfasalazine or trying even methotrexate, um, we sometimes have had to switch, but it's been an uncommon um, challenge in our, in our experience. Um, I, I don't wanna keep putting you on the spot, Bill, but there was a question from your presentation when you scope patients with ulcerative colitis, do you routinely use the Mayo scoring system uh, in your reports, and how do you incorporate that clinically? I, I tend to incorporate the language from the Mayo scoring system into the report, but not actually say Mayo 0123, just because not everybody who would read the report and need to use it will know the scoring system but I'll explicitly call out whether there's ulceration, which would make it a three, or spontaneous bleeding, whether there's friability, which makes it a two, loss of the vascular pattern, which makes it a one, or, or none of those things, which is a full remission. So I, I just use the language of the score rather than actually giving a number. Yeah, we, uh, in our group, we've tried to be a little more consistent as a group so that when we see each other's patients, we understand what might have been described there. But of course, a picture is worth a thousand words, and we all take photos as well. Um, you know the history of steroid use. There's an interesting question here from the audience. Somebody said, um, why not just use steroids to induce remission and then remove all medicines? Um, how often does that actually work, and is it sustained? Well, you, you saw from that population-based data, um, and I think in ulcerative colitis that few patients go to nothing, but what, so what was happening was likely a tapering course of steroids and then maintained with five ASAs. And with that, it worked 49% of the time over the next year. So it does work part of the time in ulcerative colitis, and that's the argument for not giving everybody so-called top-down therapy with the biologic. On the other hand, 51% of the patients uh, did become steroid dependent or were steroid refractory and needed other therapy. So you really can look at this as the cup is half full or the cup is half empty. I tend to look at it as the cup is half full and not give everybody uh, kind of top-down therapy after a course of steroids, but if you've got all the, you know, those bad prognosticators, then just get on with it. 
Um, there are a couple questions here about incorporating proactive drug levels and monitoring in practice. So I shared the results of week eight levels predicting likelihood of uh, response out to weeks 30 and 54. Um, what are you doing in your actual practice? Is this something you've incorporated routinely or do you select patients to do that? I'm probably selecting. Um, I think, you know, most of us would be using uh, drug monitoring uh, in a reactive fashion. So patients that are either having a primary non-response that you can't understand, you want to understand why, or a uh, secondary loss of response. Um, for patients that I'm worried about, so somebody with uh, bad endoscopic disease, high C-reactive protein, low albumin, if I'm giving a, a fixed dose drug like uh, golimumab or adalimumab, uh, uh, used to kenumab in the maintenance phase for Crohn's disease, I, then all the, and you've got a large patient, so you think you, you're at risk for underdosing them, uh, all those kinds of patients, I will probably do a proactive level. Anybody that you're giving infliximab in the hospital, I'm going to do early levels. But, you know, the moderate patient that gets standard dosing and is doing great, I don't necessarily look. Uh, How about, what do you do? <clears throat> That's essentially what I do. Anyone who gets induced in the hospital setting, I do an early level. It's not even necessarily even wake eight. I want to know what's happening to the drug as quickly as I yeah. can. And of course, the real world challenge is always you order the level and you're waiting a week for the results um, while the patient may or may not be doing what you need them to do in terms of response. And one clinical <clears throat> trick you can use there, the, the CRP and the uh, infliximab are really inversely correlated. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you give a patient, and, and another thing we often do, hospitalized patients often have low albumin. They're, you can just plan they're going to have high clearance. So we usually give 10 milligrams per kilo right out, the of the, same. right out of the gates. And then you should see the CRP go down. And if you don't, you can draw a level, which will come back sometime and be post hoc and informative. But within a few days, if the CRP is not budging, you can give another uh, dose and just kind of dose to CRP. We do daily CRP in our hospitalized patients. Uh, and I would say actually conversely, when a patient's CRP drops rapidly, even if their symptoms aren't completely resolved, I'm usually very comfortable getting them out of the hospital because I think we're making progress and it just requires some close follow-up. Yep. There are a number of questions here regarding choice of therapy. I'll summarize them all like this. When do you use adalimumab or golimumab instead of infliximab in UC? And when do you use vetolizumab as a first-line biological therapy? So how do you make these decisions? Well, for myself, I think that the closer the, if the patient's in the hospital and they're not in, uh, intolerant to infliximab or have antibodies to infliximab, uh, I'll prefer infliximab in the hospital patient. And the closer they are to the hospital, and we all know what those patients look like, the more likely I am to go for infliximab with a thiopurine. Um, if you have a moderate uh, outpatient, um, I think adalimumab and, and not a really huge patient, uh, that adalimumab and golimumab are perfectly good uh, choices, uh, as is vetalizumab. You'll have some discussion with individual patients about their preference for uh, IV versus sub-Q uh, dosing. The payers sometimes will require anti-TNF uh, first, although, uh, and we're presenting some data at this meeting, it, it, it now about 85% of patients have access to first-line therapy with vetalizumab. So a lot has changed since 2014 in that regard. And if you have in your mind that your payers won't let you use vetalizumab as first-line therapy, that's no longer true, I think, for, for most uh, patients. And, and certainly the really safety-conscious patient, or uh, from a patient perspective, or from your perspective, if you're... Um, you have a patient in their 60s and 70s and 80s, those are really good patients to use first-line betalizumab on. Yeah, so I, I don't want to generalize too much, but the, the elderly patient who needs a biological therapy, I think we're comfortable using Vito earlier. We have some experience using it in people with a prior organ transplant who are having some ex, uh, difficulty with their either de novo IBD or worsening of pre-existing IBD. Um, certainly patients with prior cancer history, although I want to say that the data for TNF is reassuring in that regard anyway. Um, but those are the patients we've uh, thought about in that regard. I, I completely agree with all those things. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, there's a few questions here about diet. Do we know anything more? Is there any role to modify diet or, or put a patient on some specific adjusted uh, nutritional plan when they have UC? Gosh, you know, it's the most common thing that people ask and it, it's the least satisfying to answer. So I, I think we're still in the situation where uh, at, if, and there are some studies from years past, if you took hospitalized patients with ulcerative colitis and cut off all oral food and gave them uh, parenteral nutrition with TPN versus feed them, the outcome is the same. It, it just doesn't seem to make that much right. of a difference. If you do uh, exclusion diets and systematically exclude different things, no real patterns come out of that. On the other hand, we know that the microbiome is abnormal. Uh, we can see that if you really intensively employ fecal transplant daily for eight weeks, that you can have a benefit in some patients. And we know what you eat profoundly affects the microbiome. So although I don't know what to tell patients today, I'm uh, cautiously optimistic that we will have some informative data over the next 10 years. My, my usual um, comment to patients, especially when they ask me about gluten-free, is it makes people feel a little better, but there are no data, nor do I think it reduces their inflammation in any measurable way, although um, I think that it's reasonable for them to uh, do it if they want. What I always warn them about and try to monitor is for a patient who's at risk for uh, malnutrition from elimination diets. A uh, couple of just fact-based questions, then we'll wrap it up. Um, someone wanted to know what the severity of UC was in ACT-1 and ACT-2. Those were moderate to severe colitis patients based on the Mayo scoring system who were not hospitalized. And in fact, the language of the inclusion criteria was uh, that they didn't have an impending or, or uh, it was not thought by the clinician that they were going to be hospitalized in the near future. And the median Mayo score was about nine on a scale of zero to 12. So good. So with that, I'm going to actually thank you all for being up so early.